Okay, well, hello. Um, it's great to see everyone here. It's a nice full house. I'm Nellie Oliensis. I'm the chair of the Department of Classics. And on behalf of my department, I'm delighted to welcome you to the first of this year's Sather Classical Lectures. It is my great good fortune to have the pleasure and honor of introducing to you our 104th Sather Professor of Classical Literature, Maurizio Bettini. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I'm definitely not done. I have a lot more to say. <laughs> <laughs> you, I hope you can take it because it's going to... Okay, but first... <laughs> but first, as is customary on this occasion, uh, I need to say a few words about Jane K. Sather, to whose generosity and vision we owe the institution of this lectureship. It is customary, as I've just said, to say a few words about Jane K. Sather on this occasion, but it is much more than customary. In these difficult times, when Berkeley is under attack from what sometimes feels like every possible direction, I find the exercise of thinking about Jane K. Sather's ambitions for this campus and thinking about what she accomplished for this campus to be both heartening and inspiring. Jane K. Sather had big ideas, and she also had the stamina and persistence and practical intelligence required to see them through. All this comes through very vividly in the tribute penned in her honor by Benjamin Ide Wheeler, who was president of the university when Jane K. Sather died in 1911. Her mental powers were clear, Wheeler tells us, and her thinking accurate. Vague and hazy ideas could not commend themselves to her. Soft sentiment and far-ranging theory could not move her. And yet, she was far-seeing and highly capable of taking into the account large issues, and far-reaching results. The future of this university she could foresee, and intensely practical-minded as she was, could estimate the advantage of associating her deeds and the memory of her life with the indestructible vitality of such an institution. And I love the adjective indestructible. There is probably no higher compliment I can pay to the canny, hardworking, imaginative, current chancellor of this university than to say that if Jane K. Sather had had as much institutional authority as she had money, she would have used it the way Carol Christ is using hers to ensure that Berkeley survives and thrives for generations to come. Now, if only our chancellor had as much money as she has authority. <laughs> we are indebted to Jane K. Sather for three things in particular, the Sather Gate, the Sather Tower, and the Sather Professorship. Taken together, these three things beautifully capture, I think, something of the magnificent ambition of this great public institution. As you may know, in the original configuration of the campus, before the university absorbed the area now known as Sproul Plaza, Telegraph Avenue ran right up to Sather Gate. And so the gate served to mark and articulate the boundary between the university and the town. Unlike most gates, though, Sather Gate has no doors. It was never designed to shut anyone out, but stands permanently open, forever inviting everybody in. Now, the Sather Lecture Series is likewise a major event in the intellectual life of my department, which is meant to be not just open to the public, but fundamentally for the public. Not because these lectures are meant to be exercises in popularization, they definitely are not, but because Jane K. Sather believed in the general interest and value of the most rigorous and original humanistic scholarship. As for the Sather Bell Tower, better known as the Campanile, it is not for nothing that this tuneful Berkeley landmark, which just celebrated its 100th birthday last year, was modeled on the famous Campanile of the Piazza San Marco in Venice. This piece of Europe translated westward helped align the university with the deep traditions of European culture, lending its brash newness some European patina, while literally and figuratively raising its profile. And yet, while the Campanile is designed to be seen and heard from far away, it also affords, for those who brave the ascent, a spectacular prospect westward towards San Francisco and the Bay. I can't help thinking of the Sather Professor as a sort of human Campanile, who adds to the visibility and renown of our campus and apartment while providing breathtaking new vistas in scholarship. Now, <laughs> it is difficult. <laughs> uh, it is difficult for me to imagine any scholar who more completely fulfills the ideal of the Sather professorship than Maurizio Pettini. 
Educated at the University of Pisa, Professor Bettini joined the faculty there before moving on first to the University of Venice and finally to the University of Siena, where he is currently Professor of Classical Philology and Director of the Center for Anthropology and the Ancient World, a center he founded in 1986 and where he has organized over the years no fewer than 30 major conferences. At once anthropologist, philologist, linguist, scholar of religion, literary critic, and, though he would probably resist the label, public intellectual, Professor Bettini has been gently and eloquently prodding us for close to four decades to see ancient Roman literature and culture differently. The dazzling list of his honors and awards, of the visiting professorships he has held, of the lectures and seminars he has delivered internationally is far too long to rehearse here. I will just mention as a representative sample his recurring seminars at the École des Hautes Études in Paris, his 2014 Gauss seminars at Princeton, his 2016 Hausmann lecture in London, and his 2016 Jerome lectures delivered in Ann Arbor and Rome. This list is matched by his prodigious publication record, which includes, and this is a very conservative estimate omitting all his collaborative projects, more than 25 scholarly books, an increasing number of which are now available in English translation, also in French, German, and Spanish, as well as over 150 articles. Even from this entirely superficial overview of his career, it will be evident that ah, Professor Bettini, like the Berkeley Campanile, is truly a towering presence in the field. <laughs> That's my last bad pun about the Campanile. Okay. But this is not the only reason, and not even the main reason, that I consider Maurizio Bettini to be an ideal incarnation of the professorship Jane K. Sather endowed just over 100 years ago. For a while, it is true that he is a formidably learned product of venerable European scholarly traditions. Maurizio Bettini has what I would like to describe as a Californian soul. <laughs> I say this not because we have been lucky enough through the generosity of an anonymous donor to bring him to Berkeley as a visiting professor at regular intervals since 1992. And throughout this period, he has been an amazing resource for our graduate students nor because one of his novels, and yes, he is also a novelist, is set in 18th century Alta, California. I say this because, like the Sather Gate, Maurizio Bettini simply has no investment in policing lines of demarcation. Indeed, part of what makes his scholarship so exciting is that it is not just interdisciplinary, but continually reimagines the very shape of the questions that disciplinary boundaries so often constrain or even predetermine. And he once revealed to me that his study at home in Italy is actually originally a swimming pool. And somehow this seemed to me like a perfect emblem of his intellectual. Uh, I mean, it's empty of water and full of books. Of uh, his scholarship is in this sense as much an exercise of the imagination as his novels. His work is also quintessentially humane and precisely in its resistance to all forms of presentism, absolutely timely. In a 2017 interview with Les Belles Lettres on the occasion of the appearance of the French translation of his 2014 book In Praise of Polytheism, uh, when asked if he would describe himself as engagé, you know, morally committed, he mentioned his 2012 book entitled Against Roots, a book dedicated, he explained, to one of the most powerful and most controversial myths of the contemporary world, the supposed cultural roots that would constitute our identity independently of our choice and will. This is a myth, he added, with which antiquity was very well acquainted. The same resistance to complacency, the same ethical cosmopolitanism comes through in his answer to a question about what most generally we can learn from antiquity. He replied, that there is not just one way to live, our way, my way, but 10, 100, 1,000 ways, all of them different, all of them offering us interesting models. It is the interesting difference of Roman culture that his Sather lecture series, entitled City of the Spoken Word, Orality and the Foundations of Roman Culture, will open up for us. The title of the first lecture of the series is Memory and the Ear, and finally, I give you Maurizio Bettini.
I must say uh, I'm confused. <laughs> I'm really confused. Yeah. And of course, I'm very excited by the uh, idea of delivering this first lecture of a series here to, tonight and uh, honored and humbled for being the 104th, 104th set of lectures in this department. Uh, <clears throat> the reason for my emotion, in addition to the words uh, pronounced by Nelly, and I didn't expect such a presentation, but the reason for my emotion goes not well beyond the honor that I received tonight and uh, and of course, the task that I'm assuming not to bore such a distinguished audience that I have in front of me. But uh, as Nelly has told you, uh, this is not the first time I, I, I am in Berkeley. I've been here several times. That means that part of my life, an important part of my life, scholarly and, and humane also, is strongly attached to the redwoods of campus, to Doe Library, and in particular to the many colleagues and uh, students and friends that I met here, then after that become, uh, became a, <clears throat> a stable part of my social and uh, affective life. So, and the main reason for my emotion for that is to see many of these faces in, in front of me tonight. So thank you everybody for coming. Uh, my first lecture, yeah. Uh, memory in the ear. In Roman society, there, there was a class of slaves who fulfilled a quite particular, not to say peculiar, function. These slaves were called nomenclatores, and they had the task of reminding their masters of the names of those they happened to meet by chance on the street, <laughs> so their master could extend the proper greeting. That was particularly useful in time of elections, of course. In an era when digital visual ads had not yet been invented and when slaves were plentiful, human instruments could fulfill certain functions. Technologies may evolve, fortunately, in this case, but some human needs endure, especially for those who have, those who have reached a certain age, as you know. But the Roman nomenclators exhibit a feature that renders them especially intriguing. For we learn that they were given a special name they were called fartores, literally stuffers, stuffers, a term that was more regularly and more literally used uh, of sausage makers. <laughs> Why this? One ancient grammarian explains that. And he says, uh, <clears throat> uh, they were called fartores, sausage makers, because uh, quite discreetly, they, as it were, stuff into candidates here the names of those uh, he needs to greet. So the nomenclator who recalls to the ear of one person the name of another person is like a sausage maker. Consequently, the ears are a sort of container for the information that this person receives, and the slave stuffs inside the, this container the names to be remembered. Stuffing information into someone's ears thus relates directly to an intention of affecting this person's memory. Uh, whoever stuffs someone's ears with names wishes to, in effect, make this person able to feign a memory he does not, in fact, possess, or at any rate, to enrich or amplify his memory, as if he were, we might say today, uploading new data to a computer. The question becomes inevitable at this point for the Romans, for the Romans, what do the ears have to do with memory? Let's drill down a bit. Horace, uh, despairing at the sudden appearance of the Garrulus, that terrible blubbermouth who has decided to torture him at all costs, is saved by the arrival of a decidedly annoyed third party. It turns out that the troublemaker had in fact been summoned by the newcomer to court that day, but had failed to appear. According to Roman law, in such situations, the aggrieved party had the right to drag the defendant to court through a process called manus iniectio. To do so, however, he would have to have someone willing to act as a witness. The formula uh, for enrolling someone as a witness for this purpose was licet antestari, do, do you want to be my witness? And the response was, if, if the response was licet, this yes, 
Then the agreement was symbolically ratified by touching the witness's earlobe. This is precisely what happens in our case. The newcomer addresses Horace with the formula Licetantestari and Horus Rex Ego vero apono auriculam. I offer him my earlobe. Blubbermouths are, real no are, are a real nuisance, but our attention obviously falls on that earlobe Horace extends to his deliverer. Uh, what does this gesture signify? An ancient commentator sets us on the right track. They used to touch the ear of a witness and utter these words, remember that you will be my witness in this case. The gesture's meaning, uh, touching a future witness's ear, is very clear then. It has the sense of reminding someone of something, namely that he will have to play the role of witness in the coming trial. Virgil in the Eclogues recounts that Apollo aurem velit et admonum, that is, grabbed my ear and warned me, made me remember. But remember what? The god obviously was not expecting Virgil to be his witness. There are no trials on Olympus. He simply wanted to remind him that he must return to the confines of his own literary genre, we call it poetry. In short, touching the earlobe constituted the traditional gesture of admonere, reminding. But why uh, to remind someone admonere does one touch the earlobe in particular? Pliny explains. Memory is located in the earlobe, and by touching the earlobe, we invite someone to be witness. This part of the body corresponded, therefore, to the seat of memory, Ovid suggests the same when Acontius in the Heroides addresses CDP and invites her not to renege on the oath that she has just pronounced. As a matter of fact, he says, the goddess Diana was there and had buried your voice deep in her mindful ear. The ear has memory. It is a place where information can be buried, condemned just as nomenclatores, sausage makers, do when they stuff the peasants' ears with names. And now please, uh, <coughs> please admire <coughs> this beautiful late antique cameo and this other one, very similar, in which you see a hand pulling an earlobe and there is a, a, a Greek uh, word inscribed, mnemonewe, so remember. This was probably a gift given to a fiancé, and the meaning was, don't forget me, remember you'll be my love. And, uh, really nice. Now, it might be tempting to, rele to relegate all this to some museum of curiosity or oddities, a mere fragment of Roman folklore, at the most a provocative tidbit to make a lecture a little less boring. But that would be a mistake. The ear of memory, or rather the ear's memory, can actually be interpreted as a symbol capable of bringing us to consider one of the most defining features of Roman culture, especially in its archaic period. I mean, Roman culture's close linkage with orality and the spoken word. If the Romans placed memory in the ear, this is because they were cognizant <coughs> of the fact that the knowledge residing in each person is formed largely aurally. Uh, ears and, and, and mouth together, and that human communication travels via this route above all. In other words, they knew that the faculty of memory, that which provides an identity not only to individuals but also to social groups, constitutes a kind of sediment deposited over the course of time by dialogues, monologues, stories, songs, formulas, solemn pronouncing, pronouncements, not by a string of graphic sign traced in stone on a wooden tablet or on paper, where it is no longer a question of the ears, but of the eyes. In later periods, the memory of an individual or of a community would become progressively more dominated by the nebula of the written word, curved, unwritten, printed, or digitized, taking control of every type of information or representation. Today, no one would dream of believing or even stating that the memory rests in their earlobe. <clears throat> when we observe the Roman world, and even more so, 
when we set out to describe it <coughs> or represent it, it is therefore very easy to make the mistake of ignoring the profound difference between a society for which communication and memory were entrusted to the ears and our own, where these processes were dominated by the eyes, words heard versus words read. Yet, to grasp just how different the Romans were from us in this respect, it should suffice to remember that at least until the end of the third century BCE, they did not possess a culture fully grounded in the practice of writing, in the sense that it was only at that point that the city could boast of a group of professional authors, a corpus of literary text intended for the stage, for the use in schools, to be read individually or in public, and so on. Does this mean then that after the date Roman culture after this date, Roman culture began to operate wholesale like a medieval culture, or Renaissance culture, or Roman culture, not at all, in my opinion. The Romans continued to carve out a relevant, and more importantly, independent space for the spoken word, alongside the domain of the written word. To begin to understand what this space was, the space year, the space of the memory, we can turn to a field relatively neglected by historians of literature or of Roman culture, the La. In a long frame, fragment from the beginning of the Digest, the Joris Pomponius briefly surveys the development of jurisprudence in Rome. At its origins, he tells us, the city had no definite laws for statues or statues. Everything fell under the governments of regal authority. Later, after Romulus had divided the city into third curiae, either Romulus himself or one of his successors promulgated the curiate laws. However, after the expulsion of the kings, all these laws were forgotten and again the Roman people were governed more by, by vague rules and by custom than by, by actually codified laws. To end the situation, Pomponius goes on, the government decided to nominate 10 men who would ask the Greek cities for their laws and use this as a basis for compiling a new set of laws for the city. They duly inscribed these laws on ivory tablets and set the tablets up on the rostra so they could be easily known by all. Rome thus now possessed a collection of laws pertaining to the mass, to the most important aspects of the community's life, drawing both on the last of the Greek cities, states, and on the <coughs> city's own non-written customs. We have, uh, come, uh, we have come to the creation of the famous 12 tables, a crucial moment in the history of Rome. Roman tradition definitely considers the beginning of life in Rome to coincide with the creation of the 12 tables and not merely with the writing of the laws on tablets, but especially with their public exposition so that all citizens could learn what they uh, contained. And this is a painting uh, by a painter of Siena, Cesare Maccari, and this is the presentation of the 12 tables, a dramatic moment. Uh, <coughs> This is uh, the presentation, uh, this is the aspect on which our sources actually most insist. After the creation, after the creation <coughs> of, the, of the tables, La ceased to be the patrimony of a small group capable of manipulating it at will, insofar as it had been entrusted exclusively to the habits and therefore to the memory of one social group alone. Now there was a reference text whose reading it was always necessary to consider. Immediately following the introduction of this written laws, another quite opposite event took place, which is emblematic from our point of view. The truth is that in Roman society, writing and orality continued to change roles as if in a dance as regards the practice of use of right. Pomponius continues his story. Once these uh, laws uh, were approved, as naturally as want to happen, their interpretation required the authority of jurists. Debate in the forum therefore became necessary. Together, the law and the debate slowly accrued by the jurist without, however, being written down, is called by the name of civil law. 
The laws had been given written form, yes, but the need to interpret them through debate had given rise to a kind of use that was again oral in nature. Yuski Wille was based on the written laws of the Twelve Tables, but was formed through the words of the prudentes, debating in the forum. Consequently, law once more returned to its seat in the memory and to its vehicle of the spoken word. We might say that Hughes possesses a kind of reluctance to give itself over completely to writing, almost a deliberate insistence on privileging uh, the prerogatives of the spoken word and if and of memory over those of the letters of the alphabet. As for the tablets themselves, which were so solemnly uh, set up so that anyone could read what they contained, it actually must be said that they seem to be victims of a curious paradox. These objects, which we are told so solidified the laws of the community and preserved them in perpetuity, in fact, turn, uh, turn out to be quite elusive. The Romans, Joris and Layman, always assign an absolutely foundation value to the text containing in them, yet we, not, we do not possess any concrete evidence that anyone ever saw, let alone consulted, these precious tablets. There even seems to be confusion in our sources about the material out of which they ha are supposed to have been made. Some, some sources say bronze, some are ivory. To explain this and other inconsistency, it has actually been supposed by the scholars that the tablets never existed, while others claim that they were destroyed some time later, perhaps in the Gallic fire of the 390 BC. This is a typical trick of, uh, of classical antiquity, where something, something is lost in Rome, it's the Gallic fire. <laughs> <laughs> According to Pomponius' account, however, Sextus Elius Petus included the text of the Twelve table, Tables in his Tripertita. So he has, must have been seen uh, something because he included the text in the Tripertita. But, uh, but through what channels and in what form had the text reached him? Something that Cicero tells us is interesting on this score. Cicero asserts that as boys, we learn the Twelve Tables as a Carmen Necessarium, an interesting scholastic practice, that of teaching uh, the Twelve Tables to Roman boys at the times, as the times tables are or were studied in our elementary schools. We might conclude from this uh, that whoever had gone to school would be familiar with juridical expressions like si news vocat or si furiosus escit, just as any one of us knows 6 for 6, 36. That phrase Cicero uses interesting, though. He says, ut carmen necessarium. The Latin adjective necessarius signifies something one must or or ought not to do without, like sleep for individual, is necessarius, peace for a community, necessarius, or a parent, which in Latin is called a necessarius, a relative is called necessarius, precisely because it is impossible to extricate oneself from the ties of kinship imposed to blood and family. Uh, Christmas and Thanksgiving dinner is sufficient proof of this. It's impossible, it's they are necessary. <laughs> So the Twelve Tables were a text that learned person uh, could not permit himself uh, to not know. And in fact, one, he would have learned under compulsion as a child at school. As for the, the term Carmen with this word, Latin designates a type of composition that could have been, uh, could have a, a rhythmic, a metric, assonantal, poetic, or otherwise musical character, but not necessarily. The defining aspect of a Carmen, in fact, was that it was conceived in such a way as to be easily repeated. Carmen signifies essentially a whole of repeatable phrases in the same form, removed, that is, from the flow of regular speech, which is destined to be lost immediately after being pronounced. Unlike regular speech, discourse defined as Carmen is meant to be reused in the same form or more than one occasion, as in the case of ritual formula, a spell, a poem, a precept, or a law. 
For this point of view, uh, there can be no doubt that the 12 tables were considered as a carmen, a text that could and should be repeated over and over in the same way. Still, we have not touched on perhaps the most interesting detail of this Ciceronian passage. From boyhood, Cicero tells us we learn his text by heart. This implies that through the educational practice of future citizens, the last of the 12 tables were constantly carried over into the territory of memory and orality, back again. In this way, they continue to participate in the communal memoria, traces of which explicitly, allusively, or simply involuntarily continued in effect to appear in Latin literary text. It's frequent to, to find a small minor citation of a tale table in, in poetry or in prose, but this is because they learn by heart in the school, so they came out. In short, we are dealing with a new manifestation <clears throat> of that irresistible attraction exercised by the spoken word and the memory of the ears when the law is at issue. Just as after the written, written promulgation of the legis, the non-written body of Yuskiwile immediately took form, so the very text of those last circulated as a normally repeated Carmen. <clears throat> the fact is that the spoken word represents the very origin, the very core of Roman law. <clears throat> the administration of justice is described by the expression jus dicere, literally to speak the law, and he who has the authority of exercising this function is a eudex, one who literally speaks the law. Above all, it is the word that makes law in Roman culture. Similarly, a praetor's decisions become valid when they are spoken in the form of a solemn utterance. The efficacy of any decision is based on the tria verba, the three words. He says, do, dico, adico, that the praetor fatur recites. Fari being precisely that mode of speech which defines the sphere of effective utterance. We will speak about that in another lecture. Uh, it is the spoken word of the magistrate that simultaneously guarantees public knowledge of the decision and produces its effects. Uh, so too, the spoken word gives validity to uh, the, 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 the institution that the Romans called the stipulatio, an ancient verbal contract by which one party promises to the other any kind of payment. Stipulatio was in fact a quintessentially verbal contract that consisted in the question, da responde, so do, you, do, do you promise to, to give me that? And the response, spondio, yes, I, I promise. Uh, on this, <coughs> once this verba had been exchanged, the legal obligation came into existence. Nothing else was required. This is obviously the exact opposite of the idea captured by the well-known adage, <coughs> verba volant scripta manent. Uh, simply, uh, so why, uh, why uh, by the way, this is the, the opposite, of course, because uh, the idea captured by the well-known adage is, in fact, words do not fly at all. Here, just the opposite. It is verba and not the letters of the alphabet which remain and obligate. This is the contrary. So why should the Romans ever have asserted that verba volant scripta manent? Simply, they never did. The adage originated only in the medieval period when another culture and another attitude toward the written word prevailed. The oral character of stipulatio is in fact so marked that, according to Gaius, a deaf or a mute person could not enter into this kind of contract because they couldn't speak and couldn't hear. Uh, nor was it possible to effectuate one through an intermediary or by letter. You have to be there and to speak and to listen. In Roman society, the possibility that the letters of the alphabet might come to totally predominate, the law was never accepted. For the Romans, the voice was not some outdated or merely accessory feature of the law. It was part of its very substance. To silence the voice would have meant to destroy the essence of the law. 
In recent years, scholars have insisted on the effects that the introduction of writing produced on the organization of Roman society. Rightly so. In any culture, the revolution brought about by the advent of the alphabet can only be enormous. Those little letters, as Galileo Galilei called them, he speak of caratteruzzi, those little letters, uh, uh, they are truly almighty. <coughs> but, uh, and also in Roman literature, the influence of what, uh, in Roman culture, what they called the literatura, literacy, was undoubtedly great. But this cannot overshadow the fact that some of the constitutive forms of Roman culture were realized orally and continue to develop through the medium of the spoken word. Now, when I say culture, I do not mean exclusively that poetic, literary, or intellectual culture that has come, that has been transmitted to us by the text written in Latin that have come down to us <coughs> through the ages. I mean the the totality of practices, models, basic notions that characterize the life of a community, such as custom or religion. And indeed, if we consider these aspects of Roman culture, the oral character that marks this culture's formation can immediately be seen. Let us continue our survey then. Beginning with moss, moss custom or that collection of norms and rules on which Roman society based the greater part of its behaviors. Moss, the custom, plays a critical role. It expresses tenets that are impossible to ignore. Ennius emphasizes this when he claims that uh, the Roman state, <coughs> the Roman state is governed by ancient mores and the value of man. We can be certain, at least, that Moss extended its jurisdiction from the most solemn to those most trivial of spheres in the city's life. Moss is the base of nothing less than, than the religious practices and cult of the ancients, one grammarian asserts, the religious practices and cult of the ancients. Moss also establishes, for example, the four methods by which the Senate can make legitimate decisions. In fact, any measure taken contra morem maiorum against the custom of the ancients was immediately open to debate. At the same time, it is established by Moss that spectators should applaud at the end of a theatrical production, <coughs> hardly an aspect of social life comparable in importance to religious ceremonies or deliberation of the Senate. We are even told that most imposes on actors that they come on stage wearing subligacula, that means underwear. <laughs> so in Roman society, most always seems to be at the center of attention from Senate uh, procedure to the actors underwear. But where is most recorded? Now, that is the question. Where is most recorded? Where can one go to see or check what is Moss and what is not? Impossible. A book of Morris never existed. In fact, a Moss is defined as such precisely because it is not written anywhere. A commentator of Virgil uses a neat play on words to highlight this contradiction inherent to the nature of Moss as a kind of law that remain nevertheless separate from writing. Moss, he says, is a code of living that is not constrained, and he says, at stricta, by any limit, that is, it is not written, it is not scripta. Moss is not written by essence. <clears throat> Moss is not read, or better, there is no definitive formulation of individual mores, no place where they are written once and for all. As an ancient commentator says, Moss is the memory of the ancients, memoria veterum. By what memory? Evidently, the memory that Pliny and others locate in the ear lobe, the memory formed through the spoken word, uttered and heard, but not captured and fixed in writing. Of course, you can imagine the continuous uh, controversies and debates about Morris in Rome, because they were always the subject of debate. You could not go and, and check and check a code of Morris. When we talk about the oral nature characterizing the formation and transmission of many aspects of Roman culture, we cannot neglect religion. As we know, Roman religion contained nothing equivalent to the book whose presence so strongly characterizes the revealed religions. The Godhead never directly addressed the Romans through the hand of an inspired scribe 
in order to describe itself, its own powers, its wrath, its blessing, its presence, or even how it wished to be venerated. In this sense, the difference separating Roman culture from that which came with the arrival of Christianity is truly enormous. Let's limit ourselves to a single example. In the first book of Lucretius's De Rerum Natura is an unforgettable elogium to Epicurus, he among mortals who first dare to stare down religio and resist its power. <clears throat> and no fama deum, says Lucretius, no lightning, no threatening rumbling of the heavens, of the heavens could cow him. But what exactly does Lucretius mean by the fama deum, unable to frighten Epicurus? Translating this expression is not straightforward. Cyril Bailey rendered it as the stories of the gods, but that is too uh, little, in my opinion. <clears throat> I believe that Italian philologist Camillo Giussani came closer to the truth when he translated this as what is said about the gods, because that is precisely the point. In the Fama Deum, challenged by Epicurus, what is at play is above, above all talk, what is said and what is heard said. Fama is a product of the spoken word. Not coincidentally, it derives from the same root of the verb fari, which as we have already seen indicates speaking in an effective way, a speech that has consequences, that brings about a concrete change in reality. Fama then expresses the collection of opinions or beliefs founded on talk, on the spoken word, the importance possessed by this form of communication cannot be underestimated. Quintilian explains that if fama constitutes talk banded about without the authority of a source, there is no source for the fama, nevertheless, it is considered a form of consensus among citizens and the public proof, even a public proof. That is disquieting, eh? Public proof, fama. Talk. The spoken word thus constitutes a powerful medium of social orientation because it gathers and expresses whatever the community thinks about any given thing. Dido and Aeneas could certainly attest to the power of fama since this omnipotent creature took the reins of their affair, broadcasting it far and wide on men's lips and ears. Still, what more exactly is fama deum? This definition covers the space of what is said about the gods, their powers, their role in the universe, the beliefs that they elicit without, however, being officially and definitively written down anywhere. In Roman religion, in fact, <clears throat> writing records at most lists of divinities and their relevant epithets, prayers, ritual formulas, divisions of the festival calendar, oracle to consult for the correct procedures of purification, but not that which, is, which awaits man after death, or what punishments the gods are able to inflict on mortals according to the principle of a divine orthodoxy. When, <clears throat> in 181 AC, a set of religious books attributed to no less than King Numa was unearthed, the Senate ordered them to be burned. What is thought or believed about the gods is not written, and therefore fixed in any place. What is believed about the gods is founded above all on hearsay, fama, on the unfolding of stories, proverbs, images, and so on over the course of time, which constitute the different representations that men have made themselves of the gods. Naturally, after writing was firmly established, images and representations that more or less directly came from the work of poets and philosophers, also numbered among the talk about the gods. However, the fact remains that there were never any constructions preserved in a great book and administered by a clergy who was its exclusive and authoritative possessor. <clears throat> we could go on listing other aspects of Roman culture that appear to be particularly marked by orality, but it may be enough to recall that also those two fundamental dimensions in which human action occur, I mean time and space, were in Roman culture subject to the spoken word. As we know in the Roman computation of the days, 
the nones, called nonae, uh, of each month did not always coincide with the same date, but could fall either on the fifth or on the seventh day of the month. It's the typical torture of the Roman calendar that I never learned properly in my life, so, because it changes, varies over time. Well, <clears throat> this day, uh, the nonae, was proclaimed publicly by the pontiffs at the beginning of each month on the calends, so they were spoken out. Uh, <clears throat> Warro actually, <clears throat> Warro actually uh, preserves <clears throat> the formulas that we uh, were the formulas that were recited in the Curia Calabra for this purpose. Oh, you Nocovella, I proclaim to you on the fifth day, or on the seventh day, I proclaim to you, you Nocovella. It was the public speech of the pontiffs, the act of calare, of speaking aloud, that determined the calendar. Invoking the mysterious Unocovella, they defined the measure of time. But if the spoken word had the power of defining time, it also had the power of defining space. It was the august act of effari, literally the speaking out, that had the power of describing the precinct of a templum, Speaking out a fari, a certain place, in fact, had the same effect as enclosing it with a barrier. So you speak out a place and then it's liberated or it's, it's free for the advent of new gods. The importance of the spoken word was not measured only in the sphere of solemn formula recited by magistrates, pontiffs, augurs, however. We can recognize its effects also in a sphere that for us is strongly written, poetic and literary production. Just as the voice was not simply a medium, a medium of the law, but a precondition of its operation, so too it participated, the voice, what we today call literature. As a matter of fact, the voice constituted an essential component of literature substance in Roman culture. In the absence of the spoken word, not only the law, but also literature would have ceased to be itself. We are probably not able to imagine the poet or the writer grappling <coughs> with some composition in verse or prose unless shut up in some room, seated at a desk, before him a stack of papers or a computer keyboard. Someone wishing to embellish this picture might add empty cups or ashtrays brimming with cigarettes, boots if the author persists in smoking, opium pipes if Sam Walter Coleridge occupies the center of the canvas, a crystal inkstand if it is uh, Thomas Eliot. If there is one thing, though, that we could not add to this primary scene of modern literary composition, it is the sounds of voices. But at Rome, things work differently. In poetic creation, the spoken word was not only an important but part of a literary game, but in fact had a fundamental role in it. I'm not talking <coughs> about poems like the venerable Carmina con Vivalia, which, <coughs> according to Cato, the Maiores used to sing at banquets to celebrate the glory of the ancient heroes, or the incondity verses, the uncouth verses, that <coughs> victorious soldiers would improvise to praise or deride their commanders, composition that had definite uh, oral character. The voice, the spoken word, in fact, continued to play a critical role in poetic practice, even when what we call Latin literature could already boast of creations of unquestionable grandness and complexity, works that we imagine exclusively as the product of writing. Consider the case of Virgil. The Vita Donatiana preserves the claim of the poet Julius Montanus that if he could have robbed Virgil of anything, he would have been his voice, face, recitation. His poetry sounded good if he recited it. Without him, the verses were empty and mute so much that one could steal from Virgil. 
above all his marvelous text, and Montanus cared about the poet's voice. This may be disconcerting to us, who imagine Virgil with a book in one hand and a pen in the other, his face raised toward the heavens, as in the famous miniature of Simone Martini for Petrarca. That is our Virgil, with a pen in hand and a book looking at the sky. <clears throat> but it becomes less so, less unusual, if we consider those two days over which Virgil, according to the writer Donatiana again, recited to Augustus and interrupted the whole of the Georgics. Or if you remember the time when the poet read the sixth book of the Aeneid before Augustus and Octavia provoking their well-known emotional reaction. We can only resign ourselves. For us, the poetry of Virgil presents itself inevitably as a thread of examiners arranged on paper to be read, yes, with passion, with philological meticulousness. But for the poet's contemporaries, those same examiners were fully realized only when they were spoken. Indeed, the practice of reciting his own works in public was not for Virgil, for Virgil a simple means of publicizing them like a modern book tool, but was part of the process of composition. If it is true, as the Vita Donatiana tells again, tell us again, uh, that he, a quotation, recited above all the parts about uh, which he was still in doubt, to get the judgment of the audience. And even once, another quotation, completed two as yet incomplete verses by improvising them where he recited. That was a, words of, a way of composing things. With this, we come to the well-known Roman praxis of recitationes, a practice Seneca the Elder claims began with Athenius Polio, but which we can trace further back in time. This was a, a public occasion on which an author recited his own work or had it recited by another reader. The point was to discuss the work, the work with the audience from uh, whom active participation was expected, to then go back and continue to revise. Pliny the Younger evinces this scene for us in many, many of his letters, <clears throat> a cultural milieu in which compositions were recited in order to bring them before the public, but also to receive comments and suggestions from the public. In this respect, Marshall presents us a truly elegant as well as telling paradox regarding the role of the audience in the creation of poetry. If there is something that pleases me in my compositions, he says, it was dictated to me by the audience. So the roles are inverted. It is not the poet who dictates, but the listening public. The fact is that literary composition, as Marshall says, requires the city's ears. He says that explicitly. Precisely what the poet exiled in the provinces is lamenting at the moment. Without the ears of his audience, his poetry doesn't work. Again, we register the importance of the ears in Roman culture. The same, the same ears uh, so associated, according to Pliny, with memory. Recitatio, in short, meant making the voice, the spoken word, into an instrument of dissemination and composition. Considering the many literary genres destined for recitation at Rome, epic poetry, lyric, lyric, tragedy, comedy, historical works, and above all, considering the role that public critique played in Recitatio, an Italian philologist of early 20th century, Gino Funaioli, proposed the thought-provoking parallel. Recitaciones are like the reviews published in academic journals where a work is both publicized and evaluated. Perhaps it was not wrong, except that in the case of reviews, an author who receives a bad one has no chance of correcting his mistakes of the job. In literary composition, the voice, the spoken word, exercised a fundamental role near the end of the process when a work was brought before an audience and polished into a final form. But let us not forget that the voice and the spoken word had an equally important role also at the beginning of the composition process. In the Roman world, an author very often did not write out his works by his own hand, instead dictating to a scribe 
what he wished to be fixed through the letters of the alphabet. Between the conce concept of a text, its virtual, virtual content, and its written encoding intervene the medium of the voice. This is so well known, it is probably needless to give examples. What is perhaps most interesting, however, is that the practice of dictation was used not only in the case of more or less official letters or documents, but also in the case of poetry. As the Wittau Virgil states, again, it is said that when he was composing the Georgics, every morning he would dictate the many verses he had conceived in his mind, and for the rest of the day work them down to only a handful. Thus, we should picture a Virgil who, after thinking up verses during the night, in the morning listened to them sounding out on his own lips while dictating to his scribe. At the moment of the poem's creation, it was the poet's voice that gave it the first shape. But not only literary creations, also, also learned research, our work, the work of philologists and scholars of culture, belong to the sphere of the spoken word. And this brings us back to the memory of the ears with which we began, and we are close to a finish. In a famous letter, Pliny the Younger recounts that his uncle, the elder Pliny, had the custom of having a book read to him during dinner, and that in fact he practiced the same thing when he took a bath or even when he journeyed by litter. <clears throat> At the same time, he was accustomed to dictate notes to a scribe. Pliny the, Pliny the Younger tells us that others besides his uncle also participated in these oral research performances. Perhaps it is not coincidental that it was Pliny the Elder who recorded the Roman belief that memory resided in the earlobe, so much of his extraordinary learning had in fact traveled by this route. <coughs> Aulus Gellius, sorry, <laughs> this is Pliny. Aulus Gellius, <coughs> for this part, narrates an even more striking episode of oral philological performance. He recounts that after reading aloud Alcestis, a difficult and obscure poem by Levius, he returned home in the company of Celsinus, entertaining themselves along the way by annotating philologically, he says to Blectabamus and Metatunculis, the rare words used by Levius, Almost 19 of them, all orally, and making parallels and quoting them, making allusions and so forth. <coughs> they also took the trouble of, to memorize them for later use, in case they need. <laughs> in this type of erudite discourse, too, the memory of the ears is in play. This is activated when a reader's voice takes the role we would instead entrust to the written page, somebody reciting the text that has to be commented, while the voices in the audience take over the task that we would hand to footnotes and, and critical apparatus. Naturally, we know that Roman authors and scholars practice also lucubratio, lucubratio as well, it means a solitary study and composition by candlelight, removed from commotion and mundane responsibility. This constituted only one of the two sides of the coin, however. The other displayed the image of an ear, as it were. To conclude, when we speak of the Roman word, we ought to force ourselves to distinguish its spoken component from its written counterpart, to emphasize the importance and independence that orality maintained in Roman culture vis-a-vis -vis writing. Above all, we ought to keep in mind that the role played by the spoken word in the practices we have discussed today, so we discuss law, custom, religion, time, space, literary composition, learned research, is not a mark of the backwardness of Roman culture. It is the outcome of a choice. In Roman society, there are forms of cultural practice that do not accommodate themselves completely to written expression, or only to written expression, but which require the spoken word. 
In my next two lectures, then, I will try uh, to illuminate in greater detail how the spoken word made its mark, in particular, on two fundamental patterns of Roman culture. What we call destiny, which the Romans named fatum, and what uh, the Romans named fas, a category of law that many scholars have wanted to understand as divine law, opposed to human law, but which must instead be interpreted in a different way. In my final lecture, I will try to highlight how the phonic component of the word, or better, its phonic harmony, indelibly marked the style of, of the Romans themselves eventually abandoned, but which produced extraordinary results in the most archaic phase of their poetic production. Thank you.